Welcome to Detecting DNS Anomalies with Statistics. My name is Jamie Buning. I graduated from Purdue University with a degree in telecommunications and networking a while back. After that, I went and worked for a large oil and gas company. Started off as a Unix admin for about three or so years and then moved into their network engineering group, which is global support of WAN and that involves some security technologies. From there, I moved on to a company that deals with the electric power industry, where I am currently. Spent seven years as a network engineer there, dealing with a variety of uh, network spaces from WAN, LAN, user systems, data center, VPN, and firewalls and IPS. Spent a year on a compliance team there working on some things, and most recently moved into a position with the security team, where the focus has been on this idea of kind of cyber hunting and, and working with analytics. Uh, you can find me at Jamie Bunin on Twitter. I don't tweet a lot, but it's a good way to get in touch with me. And these slides sh should be available out on this GitHub link if you want to look at those later or try to get those now and follow along. I've got some graphs and some code snippets that will be in here we'll talk about. Objectives today. Real br briefly run through DNS and how it works just so we can tie it into why it's important and why we want to find anomalies in it. A quick slide on adversary DNS use. So how they could use it and why we would be interested in identifying their use of it. And then go through a couple, walk through a couple examples on actually using some statistical uh, programming to find anomalies within this data set I have. And overall, hopefully, you know, get those examples to you and maybe generate some ideas that you can take back and use with your own data. This intro, if you're familiar, you'll know DNS is a domain name system and used since 85 and it's the phone book of the internet essentially. So the comparison here, where you know who you want to talk to, call on the phone, Joe Bob, you've got to go look up his phone number so that you actually initiate that communication and talk to him. Similarly, DNS translates that human-friendly name into an IP address that a computer can then use to initiate that communication, and you can get the resource web page typically or other type of data. A couple important points here. Practically every network uses DNS. You could say all of them do. Of course, there'll be some exceptions. So that means that on all our businesses and home networks, this is something that exists and that adversaries can attempt to take use of, particularly because if you want to browse internet resources, there has to be that path for DNS to go from your internal secure network out to public DNS servers to reach those public host names. So the brief example here, they want to go to www.example.com. The computer's going to talk to DNS server, ask for the IP address, send it on, which finally your computer can use that to connect to a web server and get the page back. Here's some record types. This is not the full list of record types. This happens to be a brief description of all the record types that exist within this data set. I'll introduce to you here in a minute. Some of them are very common as far as the A records, the quad A, text, service, name server. A couple were at least unfamiliar to myself when I looked at these. NA. PTR was something I hadn't seen before, so it in itself may be something that's anomalous to you just by looking at it there, but we'll go in and do some other analysis as well. Adversary DNS use. If you saw Jim's presentation yesterday, he talked about some things. A couple ways they can use it is command and control, and then also data exfiltration. Once they come in and compromise a system, install some malware, they want to control your system and or get data out. So this is, if you're familiar with a kill chain model, you know, it's further down that model where they're getting the command and control and actions on their objectives. A couple methods I point out here is they can encode data in the host name, so you might see long host names that don't use words really, but lots of letters and numbers in there kind of odd looking. And then also text records may be another one that can be used. So um, I'm sorry to interrupt the talk, but we did detect an anomaly. Um, director, great faith, did notice we're, we're not seeing a badge on you, so we would require a badge. Ah, excellent. You found me. Thank you for the conversation. Excellent. On this slide, too, I have some uh, links to some resources that talk about this kind of stuff. So moving on to identifying anomalies. We've got, uh, here's just a couple sections I'm going to break through there as we look through this. So statistical terms, real briefly, point out a couple of them. Talk about the tools that can be used to look at these and then also 
look at this data set again, as I mentioned, and finally go through examples of applying these statistics. Terms, you've probably heard of these, mean, median, those are both terms that describe a middle of a data set in different ways. We've got a quartile, which is just a 25% of a group of observations or data. And then outlier would be obviously something abnormal, right? That's what we're looking for. Frequency being a number of times something happened, right? So a count. And then if you look into this idea of statistical analysis or data analysis, you'll see that visualization is a very important part of doing statistics. As humans, we can see things very easily when we look at uh, a graph or an image as opposed to looking at a big chart matrix of a bunch of numbers. It can be much harder to pick out something that's different from the other sets. And this is an example of kind of this term idea. And this came from a book called Naked Statistics, which isn't a technical book, but it's one that goes over terms and how they work and describe data. And when I first started on this, I wasn't familiar with all the terms I was coming across, so it was a, it was a good basis for that. One of the examples they use is there's 10 guys sitting in a bar. Each earns 35000 a year. So very clearly we do the average, the mean is 35,000 a year, and the median is 35,000 a year. That median right between guy number five and guy number six, you add those up, average amount to find that very middle point is 35,000 still. So then what happens, you know, Bill Gates walks in. So, and we assume he makes a billion dollars a year. So now if you do those same calculations, you end up with a mean of 91 million a year and a median that's still 35,000 a year. And the point about the mean is that it's statistically correct, but it can be grossly misleading. If you describe a group of 11 people and say their average salary is 91 million, it could leave the wrong impression. So that's kind of a point about using the correct terms, and especially when we're communicating that information to other people. Tools that will be common, you see this space, are Python and R. Python is a general purpose language, considered having a low learning curve, kind of easy to get into. In order to do these statistical methods, there's a couple packages that have to be used, which are NumPy and Pandas. And then I've got Matplotlib up there as the package that allows you to do the graphing and visualization. When you look at R, it was developed originally as a statistical computing and kind of graphics programming language. So all of that base stuff is built in. There's also lots of packages for different statistical functions and things. It's considered to have a steep learning curve. Um, the example I've done, I've picked up kind of within the last year, and I haven't done programming very long, mostly looking at examples and modifying them kind of with scripting. So I don't know, it probably depends on your experience whether you consider it steep or not. The tidyverse is a group of packages that are kind of considered to work very well together when you need to go in and clean your data after you've gotten it and sort it out and kind of make comma uh, separated values so that it's easy to bring into the programming language. GGplot2 is similar to Matplotlib. It allows all the graphing and visualizations. And I added data table here. In both Python and R, there's an idea of data frames. Data table takes that idea a little bit further and is designed to be very fast with larger data sets. And this isn't necessarily big data, but it would be multiple gigabytes of data and it, it makes analysis quicker. In respect to both of them, they're both considered vectorized you know, using these vectorized data structures. And the image shows kind of that forced equation, mass times acceleration. So if you were at the console of the programming language, uh, R or Python with those packages, you could do mass times acceleration and then equals F and then you don't have to do any looping or anything. It will apply that across all of those rows in the set. Similarly there you see you can apply functions and calculations across the entire column of uh, sets of data or across rows as well. They're interpreted, so not compiled by default. And then they're both in-memory types of systems. So the data you want to work with has to fit in the system memory that you're dealing with. Here's a set of books that I found useful. Data-driven security was the first one I got into, and a lot of these examples are kind of derived from that. It starts off in both Python and R, and then about chapter three or four, it moves on and does the rest of the examples in R. A naked statistics book I'd mentioned before. R for Data Science just came out as a printed copy recently, but it's also available free online. It's not focused on security, but more on that data analysis space. And then you've got to determine how you want to apply those ideas. Python for Data Analysis would kind of be the equivalent. 
I briefly looked over that, but this is one that's been recommended a lot um, that I've heard from other instructors and folks in this space. Okay. The examples I have were done based on this data set. What I did was collected about 21.5 million DNS query response logs. And these are all for internet hosts, so we have an internal network, and it's, there's no local DNS querying or anything. They're also for client systems, so these aren't uh, network devices or servers. Focus on those users where they're more likely to bring in something malicious via phishing or browsing on, you know, uh, not necessarily great websites. So we're going to try to find anomalies there that may end up being uh, malicious activity. The time frame was March 16th to April 27th. Uh, that's about five weeks, five whole weeks, or 42 days. Uh, the data set was missing two days, the 6th and the 26th of April. And in total, the raw data was 27.5 gigabyte. Once you bring it in and you change some of those string values to integers and date time formats and things, it, it shrinks down quite a bit. And of course, we throw out some of the extraneous text as well, so it ends up being less actually in memory. So as we give it, begin applying these statistical ideas, some of the steps we go through are once we have that data and we're going to just do some real quick exploring. This is probably more important if you're not familiar with the data set or not necessarily as familiar with the data set to see what it's, how it's structured and what kind of values are in it. But it's also important to look at that so you see that when you have a field that should be an IP address, it looks like an IP address. Make sure there was no problem when you imported your data or did any sort of conversions. From there we'll move on and kind of formulate questions. What do we want to ask of this data? And then do some analysis to get answers. This is output once the data has been imported into R. This is the structure function, and it's been applied to this data set that's called DNS data. And it just shows you the class of that object. You can see it's a data table. And then there's a number of fields here that are variables that are the columns. And like I said, when you look at the query date, you want to see that it looks like a, a date as opposed to some other string or the IP address is an IP address. You see query response up there, and it shows you a few sets of records in that data set, and you can see that it's no error, and that's something that we're familiar with and would expect there. Some of the ones towards the bottom are ones that were not in the original raw data but were calculated. So the query length, for example, is just a count of all the characters in that DNS host name. That was calculated. Did some geolocation, so we got the IP latitude, longitude, and then pulled out some country information as well. We can take that set and apply this unique function and see what are all the unique record types within our data set, and these were the same ones that were in that table earlier. And then another thing we might want to know is how many clients made these 21 and a half million sets, right? So we can kind of check the length of the unique set of these query clients, and we find out we've got 1,415. So again, we're working on trying to understand our data, get an idea of what it looks like overall so we can formulate some good questions later. This is kind of just before we bring up some simple graphs here, but this is a ggplot function, and I've got some code snippets there, so I know I'm not trying to teach you guys our anything here, but just to help you follow along a little bit and connect, you know, the data set and the columns here. Obviously, the data is what's going to be displayed, your columns or subset of the data. This geom function is a geometric object, so you're going to do you know, a bar graph, or you're going to plot some points, or do a line graph, those sorts of functions. And then AES stands for aesthetics, which also includes, I want to put this data along the x-axis versus the y-axis, and some mappings there as well are associated with that, and you can do things like applying titles and labeling axes and changing some colors from the defaults. In order to create the graph that I'm going to show you next, this is the code here. So it's a little bit more complicated, but like I said, there's a title, and there's X and Y axis labels, and I did change the color there. But you can see the data was plugged in, and we're going to plot this resource record type, query resource record type, and then we're also going to do some counting there, so you can see that in the other line. And then for the GM functions, GM bar is that bar graph, and then the text has to do with getting those titles in. The snippet on here was not included. I copied and pasted that over some white space within this graph. So the, so the bar graph in the background, you can kind of see. We've got the record types across the bottom, kind of in alphabetical order from left to right, and we've got their actual counts sitting above them. And what we can see here is that the vast majority of them are A records, which we would expect. And then next are quad A, 
And in this graph, there's very short, low uh, counts there for the remainder of the records. And what we can do here, if we modify this very slightly, we can modify that same set of code to exclude the A and the quad A's and get a better view of what these other ones look like related to themselves, right? We can see the really very low ones are, you know, NE and DS and MX records. We have a more significant set of, you know, service and text in there. So again, going through, getting familiar with the data, what it looks like. One question we might want to look at initially to see an overview of this is uh, top 25 queries, right? So this is kind of a code snippet there in the graph. It's probably hard to see, but when you look at this, this is what you would expect if you think about user system, right? There's, you'll see Google, Apple, some Amazon stuff, Facebook, maybe some video and uh, streaming sites. So another quick look there. And then here's some output from the console looking at what are the unique queries. So across that whole time frame, all those 21 and a half million records, which host names are unique and that they were only queried once. And we can use this selection within this data table frame, and I'll expand that a little bit here, but essentially do an account of each query, seeing how many times they occurred in our data set, and we want to display the DNS query where it's just one. You get this kind of summary output at the top five, bottom five, ends up we've got 116,000. So it ends up being only 0.54% of our data, so that's a, a very small percentage of unique, but because we have this huge data set, it's still 116,000. So this is the point where we have to think about how can we reduce that to really see something in it. So I don't think I'll go through this. Uh, we don't use this exact sample here, but we'll, we'll go through how to filter some of that stuff out. So the first example I'd like to run through is one just based on frequency, dealing with counts associated with countries. And here's a map that uh, you can use to kind of see some differences easily. Uh, there's definitely some challenges with that. There's four plots up here for the A, uh, I think the NE, the service, and the text. And you can see the A, of course, are kind of all over the place. And you may know that where North Korea is on here, and you wouldn't expect to see any queries in North Korea, and that might stick out to you. But it's also very easy, probably easier, to move this to sort of that bar graph where you actually have the labels and you can see this. And that's what I've done here, taking that same data selection and applied it to the bar graph. On the right side, you can see a thin, tall line, and if you would guess, that's the A records. But it really shadows the rest of the data, right? There's, it looks like the vast majority of them may be near zero with this type of a scale. We can take this same code piece and just adjust the scale. The last one was just your absolute count, you know, a continuous scale from zero up. If we just specify to use a log scale, uh, and adjust that, and you can kind of see this pattern, and then we can also reveal that those ones we couldn't see before actually did have some counts, that first tick kind of on that axis is 10, and we see that it looks like there may be some that are at, you know, practically zero. So we know there's a small hand, so hand set there we want to find. And I'm going to show how we can do that here in a second with this data table structure. And this is just kind of an example of comparison to SQL if you've uh, ever done that. So DT is the data table, and you have these brackets, and you have these sections that are I, J, and by, and, and how they describe this. The I is where you're doing that filtering. You're essentially subsetting your rows. You're selecting which rows you're interested in out of the whole set. The J then is kind of, you know, what columns do you want to deal with or what kind of a calculation do you want to do to create a new field? And the by is the grouping. So we want to find exactly what those unique queries were by country. We can apply that sort of structure here. We have to get the count. We have to group it by country. And then on the end there, we add where we want those just by one. And we find there's 11 countries where we had just one query response from them out of all our 21 and a half million. If we then just created a variable here where we've got that list of 11 countries and used it then again to subset the data and get out those DNS queries because we want to see where do these people try to go, what host name was queried, to try to determine if it was malicious or suspicious. And what we see here is there's some content delivery network stuff here from Facebook, which probably isn't as interesting or suspicious. And then a couple NTP pools. So if we say we're going to let those go as low risk, we end up with three that we can really dig into. One which looks interesting is carefulmanagement.press, right? Uh, I'd never heard of it. 
Uh, fortunately, a little bit of work, a little bit of research. I used this site called Web Inspector that goes out and dynamically looks at this website. It comes back and says it's safe. It didn't find any malicious links or malicious files. And then also just check the spam house blacklist. It wasn't currently on it. www.vatican.va is the legitimate Vatican website, so it's benign, not really of interest. And then ambrightwick.com. It's pretty easy to figure out it was a U.S. registered domain. It happens that the IP is in Rwanda, but again, it wasn't on a blacklist. So what we've seen, seen kind of through this example is that we did indeed find anomalies. We found 11 queries associated with just those single responses from a country, which were out of the ordinary compared to the rest of our data set. And that's 11 out of 17.5 million successful responses. So we have 21.5 million query records total of those successful query responses saying, hey, I've got an IP address or a C name for you. Just 11 of those 17.5 million had that. And we quickly went through and determined that they were not malicious. If for some reason we thought we needed to go further with it, you know, you do other follow-up as necessary. Maybe we talk to the user. Maybe we go look at their internet browsing history and try to determine was there, you know, JavaScript on a page to try to send them over there. Or maybe you even move into your incident response plan to try to evaluate what really was the root cause for that. The next example here, well, we've got outliers, and we're going to focus on finding these outliers by query length. So that was a calculated field we had. And why are we interested in that? I uh, mentioned it earlier, you know, one of the ways that people can do DNS tunneling is by using these long query lengths. You've got to show a box plot of this, these values here, and then kind of a unique thing associated with the box plot, box plot function is that it gives you some stats values, and you can pull outliers out of it. And then we'll... We'll look at those outliers a little bit to kind of determine if they're really bad or not. The code up on the left there is how this box plot was generated. It's very simple. You just pass it the data set you're interested in, and then that the query length is the set of columns. And we can see here we definitely have outliers based on our based on our data. Uh, if you haven't seen or it's been a while since you've seen a box plot, the top points are the outliers, and then the box itself. Uh, the top of that box is the 75th percentile of your data, and the bottom is the 25th percentile. Between those two represents 50% of all of our data sets there, fit within there. And then the darker line in the middle is the median, so the entire half is below, and then the entire half is above. And then the whiskers that are at the top and bottom are your maximum and minimum, uh, what's called reasonable extreme, right? They're not absolute maximum and minimums. And what that reasonable extreme is, the it's kind of a default with the box plot function. It's 1.5 times this interquartile range, which represents that, that middle section. So we've done this box plot and kind of visualized it, seen what it looks like. And then we can go in and pull those points out. So where we have the whiskers on the top of the box, bottom of the box, we can get those actual values. I assign that same code snippet to a variable, made an object out of it called my box plot. And then we can grab the dollar stats out of it. And there's these five values, and I've labeled them over on the right. The, the minimum was one, so we have queries that were just one character. The 25th percentile ran right at 15 characters. The median is 19, 75th is 25, and then the maximum is 40. And in our case, that maximum is the one that we're most interested in. We're interested to find the queries that were above 40, because for our data set, those are outliers. If we look at the dollar out set of values, these are the actual values that are outliers. So you can see there's... 40s, 50s, some 80s in there, even 70s. And, and here's where we run into the problem again with this large data set is that we have over a half a million outliers based on our data set. So that's going to be kind of difficult to struggle through. And we can think about what can we do to reduce that number to find something that's going to be more interesting to us. And again, trying to be positive here is 2.68% of the data. We reduced it quite a bit. But what we can think about doing is dropping low-risk domains. And by that, you know, these companies and these services, right? If our users are going to Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, content delivery networks, if they're doing Netflix and uh, other streaming or audio streaming, we can decide to determine that those are low risk. And when we do that, we're not saying that there's absolutely no chance DNS telling is occurring with those. What we're saying is that using this method to detect anomalies won't work with that type of data. We might have to go back and do some other sort of analysis for those. The code line here is just one example of how you would drop any query with Google in it there. Once we get through all of that, we can easily see that this there is a standout domain, and that's 
e5.sk, which I wasn't familiar with originally. And this is just a sample of some of that data just to show what it looks like kind of lengthwise. Really long ones and then really, really long ones. And these have lots of individual letters and numbers and, it's, and they're not words, right, that you would expect. And this was a fairly quick one to determine it wasn't malicious or something that we were worried about. It turns out with some searching components associated with ESET endpoint security and their web control. And there's a quote there from the URL on the page where somebody came forward and verified, yeah, this is kind of how this web control works. When you, when the endpoint tries to go to one of these sites, it uses DNS to determine if it's an okay site or a bad site. So I want to step through just a couple other visualizations really for the most part here and show how some other anomalies can be detected looking at different aspects of this data. This here is a set of box plots that we change coordinate, coordinates on, uh, take advantage of the wide screen to kind of get a better scale. And these are all those text structure records again, it, just looking at counts of those and include this the idea of jitter. So instead of having just the points straight up and down, we can kind of see some of that distribution and see where some of these things really, um, the, most of them are. And in this case, it's alphabetical from the bottom up with our A records, quad A, and so on. And it's easy to see in this frame here where at the top we've got some text records where there's definitely some, some outliers that stick pretty far out as well as uh, service and SOA. So I took two of those and made individual plots where you can see those a little bit easier for our SOA and our, and our any types. You can see with the any type we finally get that box again because it was kind of a smaller set. And of course, from here, you could kind of do the same thing, go in and uh, assign this to, you know, something like my box plot, pull out those outliers, and then you can go find out from our data set that entry in the data set, what was a client source, uh, what was the actual domain query, and then move from there to determine if it's an issue or not. Got about three slides here where what I did was plot the query frequency by, by date, by time. So for each record type, that was queried, counted those up and plotted it across time. The A and quad are at the top, and what you can see here, if you remember I talked about five weeks of data we have here, you can see that flow of week days to weekends here. There's those spike for each individual day, and then there's very low points for the weekends. And for those not really seeing anything stick out too much, you move down to the bottom left and there's any records, there might be one there, the DS records look pretty good. In this case, the top left is MX records. And there's definitely a standout there. If you look a little on the right here, you can see where there's a line that spikes, spikes way up there. MX records by themselves from clients are kind of suspicious anyway because typically clients don't talk, uh, you know, service-wise directly with, with mail. So that might be something to look into as well. The other ones are a little bit uh, odd and not as consistent as the A and quad A's. And then we get here, the SOA again, right? It's pretty clear that, you know, there's a anomalous event going on here from counts. So we might want to see what was going on that day, that hour on the network and see what systems caused those to be generated that high. And again, here with the service records, you can see there's a representation of the week days to the weekends, but then we have this, this auto week here where there's some large spikes. And the other thing I'd would note about this is that if you kept your data down to just a week, you might see this and think it may be spikes, but it also could be normal. So because we have the advantage of uh, weeks around it, we can see very clearly that it's something that we may want to look into. Took individual plots of a couple of those just to see them a little better. The SOA record type here, we can see, yeah, definitely we've got a, something that's out of the ordinary on this day. We might want to look into it see if it was just some sort of regular business cycle or if it was something odd going on. And then this is just a bigger plot of that uh, service record type where we've got probably three kind of in the middle there, maybe one on the end. So changing over from here and moving on, we're looking closely at the time to live of DNS records and doing those counts again. This is um, bar chart here. So the importance of this is some malware activities can use very short time to live DNS records to enable easily switching their domain name between uh, between 
different IP addresses. So if we see that, that may be something we want to look, look into. In this case, the, the X axis, X axis scales out to over 40,000 seconds, and we've got hundreds of thousands of counts between these here. And again, this is a little bit hard to see some differentiations between these. And since we're thinking about low time to live, we can subset this down and say, let's look at our time to live that were returned back that were less than 40. And that's what this graph is here. We can see that there's at least a couple standouts, and then we have to consider what really does that mean when we're looking at this. And I don't know that there's too much to go off of here. There's a pretty consistent uh, base level of uh, counts across these much lower queries. We may want, knowing that we have some that are like practically zero, practically one, it might be interesting to look into those. But other than that, it's kind of hard to see if there was a, a, a big spike in other ones or, or one that snuck in that was kind of unique by itself there. Another method that you'll see when we talk about kind of data science and finding anomalies and patterns is to uh, plot two different variables, two different columns against each other and see if there's any relationship. This example takes um, across that x-axis, we take that time to live, and then we're plotting that against the query length just to see if there's anything going on there. And in this case, I don't think there really is. Typically, you're looking for a sloped line or a curve, some sort of a, a line like that to be inferred from the data. Um, and maybe some grouping. The bottom left looks like maybe there's kind of a rectangular grouping there, but stuff is kind of all over the place and very low. So in this case, I don't think it really revealed anything to us here. Another box plot here. And in this case, we're combining a couple things. Initially with the data set, taking it down just to responses that included NX domain. And NX domain is interesting because if you have a lot of NX domains coming back for clients, it can, it can be an indicator of something potentially malicious or suspicious. Right, so you have a client that is, is continually talking out and trying to get a, an IP address or an answer for a record or something. And if you had malware that has since moved on and is not using those command and control domains anymore, um, that could be the reason for those records. So, like I said, filter down and select it out just those responses that included NX domain. So from there, we then plotted their query length, so kind of combining this idea that lots of NX domains are potentially suspicious, and then taking with that the query length, long query lengths being suspicious, and trying to look at the outliers there. But before plotting this, I went ahead and also took out uh, companies and services that were probably a little risk for us. So it made a little, definitely made a cleaner graph for us. And what we can see is we have uh, not near as many outliers as the first example we've gone through. And also in this case, we have some outliers on the bottom side. So we, again, could go from here, find those specific stats or find those specific outliers and determine their domain names and kind of go through that process of finding out if it's malicious if we need to move an incident response. So inclusion here, looking at this, these examples are uh, done in R, but Python works just as well for this with lots of examples there. Some of this stuff can even be done with Excel, so if that's all you have, you shouldn't necessarily overlook that. You'll definitely be limited to much smaller data sets. You're not going to be able to fit millions and millions of records in there. But if you can move your data set into a much smaller section of information, you can go ahead and do some of that analysis in Excel. From here, the examples I did weren't particularly advanced as far as clustering and, and things, but those functions exist both in Python and R, uh, like K nearest neighbor. So trying to have use statistical methods to group your observations and two similarities. And then isolation for us is interesting as well. So you have this set of 21 and a half million queries. And if you run an isolation for us uh, kind of function against us, the whole point of that is to split up your data and then it splits it up again and again and again and again and again until it gets to, you know, identifying a very small subset that is most dissimilar to all your other ones. And that can help you narrow down uh, query domain name that's uh, significantly different from your others. And then the other point I would make is you can do all this with different data too. It doesn't have to be DNS data if you don't have that available. Firewall logs can be a good source. We talk about your client perspective, what 
destination IPs or even destination ports are they going to? What's out of the ordinary there? If you have protocol information in your logs, you can go and do the same sort of analysis. And then time frames as well, where maybe a protocol stands out where normally it doesn't, and you can identify that spike uh, in your protocol traffic. And then again, you can move on from there and look at you know your authentication logs if you're using AD or LDAP. And the sys logs and MS logs and VPN logs, particularly with VPN logs, where are your users connecting to the VPN from? You can easily find standouts if it's in countries where you know you don't do business or people don't typically travel to. And then you can follow up on that and see was the user really on vacation? And then you can pound that too if you have information from HR or timesheets or something that you can bring those together. You can determine that right away. You know, hey, uh, Susie was in the office. I see her, you know, she badged in. And so I know someone was physically in the office with her badge at least, but then we see that she's VPNing from some IP address in Russia. That's probably something we want to follow up on. Thanks. If you guys have any questions, we can run into those right now, but I definitely would recommend those books. I really like the data science one uh, based on security. It was really a, a good idea generator. And again, these uh, slides are out there if you want to grab those and get a better look at those images. Folks, we have a few minutes for questions for the speakers uh, available if you'd like to ask questions just by a show of hand. Jamie, could you explain a little more about DNS tunneling and why it's bad? Can you repeat that? The question was, could you explain more about DNS tunneling and why it is bad? DNS tunneling and why it's bad. In one of the slides, there's a really good paper from the SANS Institute that goes over methods that can be done. So DNS tunneling, I've seen in uh, news and you know these security sites talk about it a little bit more. It's been a method that uh, adversaries have latched onto just because it's so available. So DNS tunneling uh, allows them to just do uh, command and control, right? Send their commands, you know. Uh, I want you to, now that I have my exploit and stuff on your system, now go to this website out on the internet and download this ransomware and then execute the ransomware. Or it can tell the system to, okay, now give me a listing of, you know, all the files and your, uh, your root directory and look for stuff that they want to take with them, whether that's credit cards or personally identifiable information, you know, types of espionage, whether that's government or corporate, um, could be something of interest. And in that, in that word cloud, that was a combination of malware that was known to use DNS tunneling techniques as well as a number of utilities that enable DNS tunneling. And from a data exfiltration point, I think the paper talks about the uh, the rate is maybe like 110 kilobit, which isn't a whole lot. But when we consider in the past that our adversaries or actors have been in an organization for up to a year, and if they've been, you know, exfiltrating data for that long, even though it's a small bandwidth, they can really collect a lot of information. So I, I think that it's kind of significant because it's, it really does go under the radar. We, uh, had not been logging DNS queries until maybe the past couple of years. And so it's a really good set of information, but obviously it takes up space and it takes up resources. So it depends on if you can use it uh, to see what's going on. So I, I guess I'd, I'd say that about it. I'm not an expert in how DNS tunneling is used, but besides the, besides being able to detect DNS tunneling potentially by those long query lengths, some other types of analysis you can do maybe are on the exact payload or on the timing of the queries, right? So when we do web browsing, we don't ask for a website. We don't, we don't do any DNS query, you know, on the hour, every hour, for example. So if you can do analysis and determine that you have a system on your network that at, at 1 p.m. every day queries for a specific domain, you can kind of get through the noise and see that potentially. Um, so those are a couple different ways of analysis that can maybe be used for that. So how often do you do this? I mean, do you run this on a weekly basis, daily basis, hourly basis? So far, this is something 
something fairly new. The team I'm on was created about a year ago to focus on this. And it, it takes time. We haven't automated it yet. Some of the difficulties are getting the data. So we don't have a dedicated system that's main purpose this is to store data and deliver data. So you may have a SIM that you send all this data to. But SIMs are focused on doing the correlation and bringing the data together. They're not designed to pull data back out of. So that can be a challenge and one thing that increases the time needed to do this analysis. And also just being, uh, you know, building in the maturity. Typically what will happen is you do some type of analysis and you find that it's, it's useful. And you try to automate that part, which then can become something that occurs maybe um, on a basis of, of, of weekly. These were kind of one-offs right now. And when, if you're, I don't know if you're familiar with cyber hunting at all, or that idea of just uh, active defense going out proactively looking for things, uh, it's hypothesis driven a lot. And that's kind of where this fits in for us. So with the idea of, you, know, you might say, okay, at my organization, uh, if we're infected with malware, we're going to see client systems making queries that are extremely long host names. And so then you go about, okay, what, what data do I need to answer the question and what kind of processes do I need to apply against it? So at this point, we're not doing it regularly, and I think that it'll take some time for us to figure it out. The analysis itself here, probably between other work activities, took like a week to get together. They'll say in data science, one of the, the biggest time sinks is the data preparation it takes up 80% of the time. So the kind of that, this idea of being a data janitor getting it ready for analysis. Once you have it in the system, uh, and it being a scripted language, you can at the console change things up very easily and, and look at the data in many different ways, which can be advantageous. But like today, we don't have any reports that are generated from these graphs that we, we send to anyone. Pretty much it's kind of this individual uh, document, this this hunt that, that we do, right? We're going to, this is the question, this is how we're going to try to answer it, and then we would include, you know, the charts and the types of things we went through to answer those questions. So um, I, the examples I showed didn't include any malicious um, activity. Uh, no one was too hot on sharing that. But these same types of things, you will uncover stuff. Even if it's not malicious, you're going to find things where you have misconfigurations or maybe not best practices, and then you get into that business improvement, lessons learned type of uh, activity. And so you did actually find value out of this you identified absolutely absolutely issues. we do yeah uh, let me just a second Make sure I can hear this. So how long did it take to crunch the data, and what kind of processing and power did you have? So from that data, initial data um, collection, so if we start at getting the data, what we've done for this is there's a couple scripts. There's a uh, PowerShell script that goes daily and pulls these sets of logs from our DNS systems, and then dumps them kind of on that scratch space that, that we have access to. And then there's a Python script that does some initial uh, pre-processing, so putting it in those fields that are easy to bring it into here, which is nice. So uh, deciding that time frame, I had you know, this March to April time frame, pulled that over, didn't take too long, and then going through and actually bringing it in. So, so you know, there's that daily process going on that we don't have to go and manually do, and then copying the data over from a network drive doesn't take, take too terribly long. Uh, when I've timed bringing in this uh, large set of data, uh, it goes actually pretty quick relative to, I guess, what we're talking about. If I start up and I need to load this into memory, it takes um, between two and three minutes to get all that data into memory. And then uh, once it's into memory, we can begin applying things to it. So generating these graphs, uh, the one with the worlds probably took the longest because it was plotting a lot of points, about a million points on that graph. It took a sample of the full data set. But when you go through and the box plot, it comes back within seconds when you run through that. Um, and it depends, too. If, if you're plotting something like the A records, right, there are a whole bunch of them. So it kind of filters out that to begin with. So if we're excluding the A and the quad A, you can tell it goes much faster. But this isn't a 
situation where, you know, I, I tell it to do something and then I go get coffee. I can sit there and actually see it come back. This work was done on a, um, it was a quad core system with multi threading, so it has eight logical processors and 32 gigs of memory, and, uh, you know, two to three, you know, gigahertz on each one of those with SSD drives to speed it up to. Yeah, I know you touched on this a little a bit earlier, but briefly, um, can you explain the advantages of R versus Python or something like Mathematica? So, uh, I heard a question kind of regarding R and Python, and what was the... Mathematica. Oh, Mathematica. Um, I'm not familiar with that, but I know there's some very commercial um, products for this. So, um, if we look at where R came from, there was this S programming language before it, and someone wanted to kind of create the open source version of it. But you've got things like Tableau, and I think uh, Click also does some of this visualization and, and things. Um, and then there's SAS as well. It seems like with other open source stuff, people, one of the reasons people kind of gravitate to R is because of that community and because it has uh, just a lot of packages focused on statistical analysis. Python has really kind of come up, and it's pretty much on par with R right now as a, um, from that aspect of statistics. And so you get in that, and you have a lot of uh, examples you can go from. Uh, I adjusted like color and set some titles on these images we had. But you can make them look a lot prettier than that. If you, if you go out and you look at some of the examples, you can see people where they've done a lot of work and... They look a lot better if you're going to go into kind of report generation or something where you're going to present it to someone, um, maybe at a executive level or board level, or you want to include it in some sort of a publication. You can do that. Of course, the benefit is that you know it's free, it's open source. You can get, you can pay for support for it, right? But these are tools that are available, and you can grab and use as opposed to SAS being a really kind of uh, uh, it's a high end product, but it's, you know high priced as well, from what I understand. Appreciate your time. Hope you guys have a good rest of the day.